just a note to all anyone using a microphone today, they are directional, so you have to like pretend you're Beyonce or somebody and hold it like this right up. It's kind of cool to do this, but no one can hear what you're saying, so right in front of your mouth. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll just um, run through the format of um, the next bit. Thanks for coming back. I always feel like I should say that. It means we didn't scare you off. You earned that, Alex, that pastry. I'm keeping tabs here. Okay, I hope you had some good conversations in the break. Nicola and I worked out that we have a connection with the same textile factory where I started my career, which is weird what you find out during a coffee break. Um, okay. Differently. Um, we're going to hear, f uh, first of all, uh, from Christophe Minier, who's in, in effect our leader. Hello, Christoph. You get set up and I'll run through the next bit. Um, and then we're going to have four 10-minute talks. It's a bit like TED, TED Talks, but more exciting because we're in Chichester. Um, uh, and um, at the end, then we'll, we will take questions. So if you've got questions, jot them down or try and remember them. And um, we'll scoop them all up at the end. Um, and that will need to be quite rapid fire. Um, just tell me when you're ready, Christoph, and I'll stop going on. Um, and um, I hope you all had a chance to see our posters as well. Lots of interesting information. Is this has been live streamed? Is it? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, will people be able to people be able to see it afterwards? Is yes. Good. Okay. I'm just always conscious that when there's a lot of information, <laughs> it's hard to take it all in in one go. Ready? Well, we'll soon see. This is your microphone. There you go, Christoph. So, um, uh, Christoph, Professor Christoph Minier is Professor of Biology from the University of La Havre in Normandy and joins us from there. Thank you for coming. And over to you. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, we've got some problem with it. We have a slideshow, but it will be sorted out uh, hopefully uh, very soon. Because we, we lost the mouse, okay. <laughs> so I, I would like first to, s uh, to thank you, all of you, for being here. <laughs> yeah, it's very important uh, that you're here. Uh, Red Bull is about changing things. We hope to, to change things, and uh, what change things is people thought, people awareness about pollutions and it's great that uh, we have the opportunity to, to exchange about what we think is very important for our health and for the health of the environment. So uh, I would like also to thank the organizer. Thank you for just uh, our work observancy and all the people that worked here and especially you, Richard. Thank you for so much for making this happen. So, um, Red Pole is a, is a uh, European program uh, financed by Europe and uh, that uh, gathers several partners, including just a Harbour Conservancy, uh, several universities, University of Brighton, University of Portsmouth, University of Caen in France, and University in Le Havre, where I'm from, and also a uh, research institute like INERIS, and um, uh, a private company uh, looking for toxicological tests, which is it's a French one called Toxem. And all of us are trying to uh, m do a little things to make things change 
uh, about endocrine disrupting compounds because REDPOL stands for reduction of pollutions by endocrine disrupting compounds at source. Um, as you see, we have a, a, a focus on endocrine disrupting compounds. Uh, so we heard about <coughs> the effects of endocrine disrupting compounds so far. Endocrine disrupting compounds can be everywhere. Uh, we, we heard that uh, there are some in plastics, there are in uh, health care products, in personal care products, and also in pesticides. So what I would like to stress first is some of the ca ca characteristics, the very specific, why endocrine disrupting compounds are so specific that we wanted to work on it, and maybe not the others. So some of the characteristics, as already mentioned, uh, so I apologize for that, uh, but uh, I think it's, it's worth taking some time to think of what these compounds are, I, I, won't, I, won't, I, I won't speak about the endocrine systems, uh, but uh, endocrine disrupting compounds is related, obviously, to endocrine systems. So the endocrine systems is, is a complex network. There's, it's a system that uh, uh, use hormones as signaling messages. So it's very important to uh, for all our body and all the... Uh, uh, animal's body uh, to develop and live uh, correctly. What I would like to stress uh, and you to remember is that uh, this endocrine system is very important, at least for metabolic activity. Each of our cells is regulated by signals. So it's very important that to understand that all the metabolic activities of any, it's not only a sum of the a part of the body that receive message, all our cells are interconnected. And metabolic activity is regulated by this signal and it's very important for the proper functioning of our body. Endocrine system, uh, endocrine system is also involved in development, reproductions and Behavior, sorry, it's, it's in French. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so uh, it's an important system, and endocrine disrupting compounds will may interfere with all these very important physiological systems. And because it's a complex, because it's a complex network, sorry, from the sun, uh, there's many targets for xenobiotics to interfere with. So I would like to emphasize four characteristics of endocrine disrupting compounds. I'm, and first, I'm, I go back to classic toxicology. I'm sorry about it. It's very simple. Uh, in, in toxicology, when we, we study uh, dose response effect, uh, we usually say the effect is monotonous. It means that uh, if, if, you, if you have a, a glass of wine, of French wine, <laughs> you, you will feel good. But if you had too much of, of, the f of this wine, you, will, you might feel dizzy. And if you have really, really too much, you, you might be ill, and, and alcohol can be very dangerous. And you, by saying this, you, you can measure the effect and the intensity of the effect. So. I, and it's, it grows with a dose. This is the, the dose, the amount of alcohol, and you've got some dose that are not doing anything, and then it increases until the effect is very strong. So that's the classical toxicology. What's so special with endocrine disrupting compounds? It's, it doesn't always respond to this low. And that's what we call the non-monotone dose response relationship. Here we've got a, a result from uh, a null study on mice, and uh, uh, mice has been dosed with 
uh, a very potent uh, estrogenic compound during the uh, during gestation. And what we see here is the effect of the os offsprings, the prostate weight of the offsprings. And if we look at the results, we can see that there is a control here, and at a certain dose, we see an effect. It's increasing the prostate weight until it peaked at this dose. And this effect is very important. It, it shows that uh, these compounds can enhance the, the growth of a prostate. And you should not think it's good because it, it enhances the, the growth of the prostate because it gets hyperplasia and, and uh, different physiological, physiological changes. So it's on the way to cancer, for example. So it's, it's a dramatic effect. It's, it's it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, but if you increase the dose, then you, you see it's the, the intensity of the effect is lower. Until a very high dose here, you lost the weight. The in, in fact, the prostate then is, the cells of the prostate are, are killed by the, by the compound. And this is classical toxicology. You see, the the mace is bit because of the mace age, they change the development of the prostate. And as any compound, because any compound can be toxic, when you increase the dose, there's, there's uh, a power for any compound to kill cells. And this is non monotonic. And this is something very different from, from the classical toxicology. So that was the first. The second one, it's still the same, the same figure. Now we can look at the dose. Here we, we use dose that are in nanogram per gram. I, I know that uh, Alex already told you about, about the dose and very low dose. This, this is very important because this is very low. If you look at this first one, it's 0 0.002 nanogram. So that's picogram per gram. So it's really, really nothing. Well, not nothing, not nothing. It makes a difference. Oh, not, not at this stage, but this. At, at 20 picogram per gram or 20 microgram per kilo, you've got an effect, an effect that is uh, uh, dangerous for the, for the adult then. And so uh, endocrine disrupting compounds can interfere with the um, with a system at very low dose. Usually the people think that our, our uh, nervous system is very sensitive. You can feel the heat uh, and, and the flavor at very, very low dose, just when tasted a little drop of wine. Uh, but the nervous system and the endocrine disrupting substance is, is very different. The endocrine sy and, uh, systems is at least 1,000 times more sensitive than the uh, nervous system, at least. So that's very, that's the most sensitive systems we have. Our hormones are acting at very, very, very low dose, at this, at this picogram in our, in our body. So that's why it is so special. And the thing, the thing that is uh, uh, worrying is that when we test the compounds, when ev you know that every compound has to be tested before it gets on the market, we we can get toxicity. Now, I, I know you know. I'm, I'm sure you already seen this pictogram. This this means that it's toxic compounds. But for for this for 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 a compound to have this pictogram, you have to prove that it's. The toxicity is below five milligram per kilo. And that's the lowest things we are asked to screen for, for any compound. Five microgram per kilos, this is 0.2 microgram per kilos. This is a very toxic. These compounds will have, will get this. But it means that every compound that we screen for uh, any regulatory assessment, we screen only this. We never go. So 
any compounds we are on the market have never been tested at this low dose. Never. It's only s research that came from the endocrine systems and, and people think that, wow, oh, some things are happening at very low dose. But this is not compulsory because the low is there. And, and any, any company will test only high what we call high dose, which is might be low because it's under five microgram. But in fact, we don't know about all the effects of the compounds. They have never been assessed under regulation. So that's a low dose effect, the second one. one. And uh, I, I want to stress that to explain it, because it's different from classical toxicology. If we, if we think of an uh, endocrine system, the endocrine systems, scant uh, several actors. For example, one that might be the brain, they get message from the body or from outside, they integrate the, the message, and then it decides, it, it, it releases a hormone. And this hormone will be released in the blood system and act on a different organ. And this different organ will understand the message. And there will be some change, and uh, uh, in turn, will release another hormone, the hormone B. And then B, the brain will adapt also its, its uh, system, its hormone level. So it's explained there with a balance. So the endocrine system is a lot about balance. If we get more of one, you get an action. And more of the others, you get the reverse. And if you think that uh, what, what an endocrine disrupting compounds will do on this, it's not acting because it's toxic. Just think that a compound C will be there. Then the balance is, is going down and the regulations change and the, the message is, is lost, it's different. And it will, it will have dramatic effects, which is not intended by the body. So you see that's very different mode of action than the usual toxic compound. It's what we call the Trojan cell. You, you know the story of the Greek. It's, it's the endocrine disrupting compound <laughs> acting inside our body to change the, uh, the, uh, the, the message that regulates our body. It's not killing the cells, but the effects will be dramatic anyway. Okay, Alex already told you about this. I would like to emphasize, emphasize uh, this because it's very important. Uh, you know the classical toxicology says the dose makes the poison. We've seen the curve. But it's not really true with endocrine uh, disrupting compounds because we, uh, Alex told you about feminized fish. We, these are feminized that are called also in Le Havre, this is gudgeon, this is flounder, this is male, T this is testicles. So you, you can see spermatozoa, but there's also oocyte in it. And here in flounder, this is uh, a male part and all the other part is ovaries. Doing this experimentally is, is easy in the lab. We, c we can grow fish, put some uh, estrogenic compounds and get into sex fish. But we know that there will be a time frame, a, a, a short window, when, when it will be very effective. It's for roach, for example, it will be 50 days at, uh, after hatch. So it means that it's not only the dose that makes the effect, because uh, the same dose with a hard old fish would not do anything. It's not only the dose, it's the time that is very important. It is the same with many species. If a young girl is exposed to testosterone just after her birth, she will be unfertile for her life. That would be the end. So one of the characteristics is it, it's not only the dose, it's also the timing of exposure, which is crucial to uh, the outcome. And so that's, that's why we have a usually a focus about uh, early fetal development or postnatal development because uh, this stage are very uh, uh, important because 
many things can be programmed during our fertile life and it will stay for life then. And the last thing I will mention uh, is transgenerational effects. Uh, Alex told us about the, uh, the story uh, on DTL Silvestrol. Uh, you know that the, the constructive pills that woman takes and and it has a dramatic effect on the reproductions on, on the, the young girls but also the boys and we know now that the second generation has been affected by the pills that the grandmother has taken and now we're looking for the effect of the third generation and we have al already some insight that male at least young boys might be affected again and so we've got we've got more and more evidence and some compounds can change the physiology of the offsprings for more than one generation we've got indication for uh, reproductive effect for four generations for cancer at least for two generations so this is very uh, important and it's not uh, mutations uh, it's change that we call epigenetic modifications and that's very important because y you know now we also introduce that the effect does not depend on the dose but also on the history if a physician will uh, will should look for what's going on with you that is going wrong the uh, he should not only ask you uh, where do you live what do you eat wha what you have brief what you have drinking Wh where do you live when you were young but the real question one of the of the questions he should also ask is what happened to your grandfather so that makes a lot of difference so uh, this is the four uh, characteristics I wanted to mention and that's what brings us to to this program and this program that uh, uh, some other people will present to you uh, in details is really about learning more about about these endocrine disrupting compounds because in fact we, we get it's it's something new and, and I even if it's new uh, we ha we still have to uh, to argue with other scientific people about all this and what the meaning and what will be the regulatory consequences of all this so Red Bull is about knowledge and communicating the knowledge and also translate this knowledge into tools that may be useful for to assess the uh, the effect of the compounds because in fact we we, we there's many compounds we never assessed any 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 effect on the endocrine systems and and as uh, Alex said uh, for some species we don't know we, we we don't know how to assess we have to develop the the knowledge and then the tools for it to be translated into um, a knowledge about the effects of the compounds and then hopefully maybe they will be banned at source so we have also to, to push for one for the tools uh, for the regulatory assessment and we will talk about this later so I'm done with it so now it's a turn for your best Uh, thank you so much to uh, uh, Professor Christophe Minier. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for leading this project. And thank you for that amazing presentation explaining why this project is happening. Thank you. And we're now going to move on to the um, four slightly shorter presentations where we're going to go into some uh, even greater depth. Um, so remember, if you have questions, um, we'll bring you back, Christophe, at the end for some questions, hopefully. Um, okay, so our first presentation is... Um, and Suzanne is Senior Research Associate at University of Portsmouth, specialising in understanding pollution effects on crustacean um, behaviour. We're very uh, pleased to have you with us this morning. Thank you very much. Just getting set up there. 
and just let me know when you are ready. So, oh, great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucy. So, yeah, I'm Suzanne. Um, so, I will do a little bit of a different approach. We heard a lot of, uh, from Alex and from Christoph now about how nasty chemicals can be. Um, and I will present the data from University of Portsmouth, but not how nasty the chemicals are, more like how do we test for these chemicals. So, does it work? Yeah. So our project is on developing the bioassays for um, assessment of pollution effects on crustacean behavior. So we work with crustacean. Where is it? There we are. And we developed a behavior assay. And then we tested a few compounds and assessed their effect. But to develop these assays, we have to ask quite a few questions first. First of all, why are we working with crustaceans? Why are crustaceans important? And then second, why are we looking at behavior? Because behavior is a little bit of a weird thing. And then, of course, how do we develop these tests and how do we measure behavior? So let's talk a little bit about crustacean. Crustaceans are also called the insect of the sea. There are more than 67,000 marine and freshwater species in the world. They live in different habitats, like in open waters, in the water columns. Some of them live in the bottom of the sea and the lakes and the rivers as benthic species. Some have uh, symbiotic relationships with other animals and plants, and sometimes these symbiotic relationships can be more parasitic, so they live off uh, other animals. They do fulfill a very important environmental function, first of all as food source for other species, but they're also good in nutrient recycler. They are filter feeders, they take out small microparticles from the water columns, they are scavengers, they feed on dead animal and plant material, but they are also good in population control as herbivores when they feed on seaweed, keeping our shores a little bit clean of overgrown from seaweed, or as predators feeding on other animals like sea urchin. We work with amphipods and shore crabs, so the marine amphipod, Echnogrammarus marinus, and the common shore crab, Cusinus um, nanus. They are key species along the UK shore waters. As Alex showed already with a picture, um, the amphipods are shrimp-like creatures. They live in the seaweed and they feed on this seaweed, so they're really good for the seaweed population control, and they provide a food source for other animals like fish and birds and other crustaceans. We have the crabs. Crabs live on the bottom of uh, the sea, a spantic species. They are predators, um, they feed on bivalves and marine uh, worms, on other crustaceans, and they provide a food source for birds, fish, and also we eat them too. So we collect our amphipods in um, Langston Harbour and our crabs along the shores under the rocks, and this is uh, how, how they look like, and then we take them in buckets back to uh, the lab. Now, with behavior, using behavior as an indicator of pollution, Alex and Christoph already gave a really good overview on what ecotoxicology actually is, looking at survival, looking at reproduction success. However, when we throw in behavior, um, pollution can also have an effect on our behavior. As we talked about all these hormones and hormone production, hormonal function, we know that hormones kind of, they... Uh, de uh, determine our behavior, how we behave daily. It's the same with the nervous system. We have the neurotransmitters, we have serotonin, we have dopamine. All pollutants can work on these system and also on respiration and energy levels. So all these pollutions can affect our behavior in terms of mating, how we behave around mates, how we migrate with locomotion, how we feed and how we avoid predation as well, and of course our social behavior. So again, that was what Alex uh, showed before, that we have chemicals that can work on nanograms per liter um, concentration. That's especially true for any kind of uh, pollutants that work on um, behavior. Because with the normal or the traditional risk assessment for pollutants, when just looking at survival rates, 
they usually are more at medium to high concentration of micrograms per litres to milligrams per litres. So pollution uh, behaviour can be used to uncover effects um, of environmental pollution and should be included in risk assessments. So the problem is with behaviour assays, it's quite a challenge to develop them. Because first of all, what kind of behaviour do you look at? Which is the most important? And then it, the other question is, how do we assess this behaviour? We can't go to these animals and ask them how they are feeling. So in terms of our work from the University of Portsmouth with the amphipods and the crabs, the behaviour we chose to look at is mostly locomotion, because locomotion is really important for feeding, for predation and for mating. We can induce this behaviour with a behaviour stum stimulus, and we use light because these species are negative phototactic, so they try to swim away from light because they don't want to be seen by a predator, so it's more an anti-avoiding um, avoiding predation uh, technique. So with the assay we developed is we use these animals, we put them in crystallizing dishes in water, and then we can put them in different incubators at different um, temperatures, at different light regimes, and then when we've done that, we can use a behaviour unit to analyse their behaviour. So this is this wonderful box. Um, it has an infrared camera on the bottom. And then we have these overla uh, overhead lights where the dishes are on top of it. Um, and we can place it and the camera can film from below and see the movement of these animals. The light thing is the mo um, crucial part here as well. So we can switch on the lights uh, on these overhead, um, overhead plate um, to a light regime of two minutes dark, two minutes light, two minutes dark, two minutes light to induce their locomotion. And then we track their locomotion with the software. And it looks like this a little bit. So on the left we have the amphipods, on the right we have the, uh, um, the crabs and they move around and we can measure how much they travel uh, within these eight minutes is called distance travelled. So the amphipods are usually a little bit faster than the crabs. So when we have done that, we have data analysis. Of course, we get a lot of data and quickly to show how this data can look like. This is data from amphipods. Amphipods have two different sexes. We have males, we have females and we have brooding females because um, these females, they hold their juveniles in the ju breeding pouch until they're ready to be released. And we can measure how much they travel. That's what's on the y-axis. On the left, it's in 10 second time bins, and on the right, in two minute time bins during these dark and light periods. And what you can see is that they travel much more during the light period than the dark period, which is what we expected. And the blue lines are the males and the females are the red and the darker red ones. And what you can see is that males usually respond much better to light stimulus, so they might be better to be used in those kinds of assays. So, sorry. Um, when we throw in our pollution, so our compound of interest, we can of course expose these animals to, um, to our compound of interest. And to give you a quick example of how this data can look like, this is data on amphipods. They were exposed to thyrum. Thyrum is, um <coughs> is a fungicide. And on the top, there's a 10-second time bin data, and on the bottom, the two-minute time bin data. And the black line and the black bar shows the control animals. So these animals weren't exposed to any thyrum. But then you have this yellow one, I don't know if you can see it, but the yellow ones are animals that were exposed to 100 micrograms per litre of thyrum. And what you can see is they don't move much. So they're not travelling. They're alive, um, so they wouldn't come up in ecotoxicology as a survival dead or alive ones. They just don't move much compared to the control ones. Now you can say, oh, 100 micrograms per litre is quite high we see effect at one micrograms per litre as well, so thyrum is not a really good thing to put in the environment. Another um, assay we developed is crustacean mating behaviour. So we are looking at mating behaviour in crustaceans with the amphipods, male and females, and usually the males search for a female and then they jump on the back, hold onto it for several days, and, and so they swim around like this, 
um, until the male finally can fertilize the eggs in the brooding pouch of the female. The time it takes a male to search <coughs> for a female can be measured, and that might be affected by our compounds of interest or by a pollutant. So this is how one of the assays look like. You have these long dishes with males and females separated on the side with a divider. You can take that away and then you can measure the time, how long it takes them to find a mate and there's a small mate that was successful. So to summarize, we, have, um, we developed these two assays, the behavior assay for locomotion and the behavior assay of mating. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Suzanne Vogeler. That was absolutely incredibly interesting. Okay, um, our next speaker is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cannes and University of Le Havre. Um, her background is in the study of bioluminescence and um, uh, Anaïd's uh, contribution to Red Pole, to the Red Pole project, is to develop colour change in cephalopods and crustaceans as a new proxy of neuro neuroendocrine disruption. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I take this opportunity because, yes, I'm, I have a double affiliation. I'm both from the University of Caen and the University of Le Havre. Um, so I wanted to in introduce also my, my colleagues, two of my closest colleagues uh, in this Red Pole project, uh, Cécile Bélanger, who is uh, with me here today, and uh, Thomas Knigger, who is not here, unfortunately. Um, the both of them have been working together for, for a couple of years now, um, combining their, their expertise in, uh, uh, for Cécile uh, cephalopod neuroethology and for Thomas in uh, crustacean ecotoxicology, in a view of developing uh, behavioral uh, ecotoxicological endpoints, just like Suzanne uh, talked to you about. Okay. So, like like Suzanne, uh, we've been working uh, with uh, locomotion endpoints, but also with color change, and this is what I will focus on today. So uh, Alex showed you a, a pumas, so why not showing a, a chameleons? I will not talk about chameleons, um, but I wanted to 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 put forward this uh, this example because it it's like it's kind of uh, very familiar and um, it's typically the kind of color change we are interested in. It's typically uh, um, it's what we call physiological color change. And it's typically fast and reversible, as opposed to what we call morphological or developmental color changes. Uh, to be more specific, uh, physiological color change um, uh, relies on movements of pigments, um, while uh, for uh, morphological and developmental color changes, um, these structures, pigments, or other kind of uh, structure involved in, in coloration in animals um, require further alteration like degradation or de novo production of structure. So here we are focusing on, on this physiological kind of color change. Um, here is an example of, of cuttlefish uh, preying uh, upon a shrimp and you see that the, co the color change is, is quite fast and impressive. Uh, we have many things uh, happening here. Uh, the the color change um, is uh, involve um, camouflage elements, but also uh, anti predator elements and even uh, elements of uh, emotion related uh, elements. Uh, that's uh, there is uh, a nice story to tell uh, around this, but. I would like to focus here um, more in detail on these uh, so-called uh, movements of pigments happening uh, in physiological color change. So the, the, um, the fundamental units, the effectors of physiological color change uh, are what we call chromatophores. So these are basically uh, pigments containing cells um, being able to 
to concentrate more or less the pigments, so the animal appear more or less dark. Here in uh, in cuttlefish, um, this chromatophore consists in, in a kind of uh, elastic sac uh, connected to a ring of uh, muscles that can contract or uh, relax, so um, expanding the elastic sac or let it go back to, to normal when they relax. I'll show you a, a short video illustrating that, so that's a high magnification um, video recording of, of um, uh, a patch of skin, uh, cut off his skin, so you see it's, it's very, very dynamic and, and very beautiful. Here is also a short, uh, short animation showing you this, um, this chromatophore, so expanding and uh, retracting, as you see. You see that there is um, a kind of layered orga organization. There are several um, types of colors of pigments, and they are organized in layers inside the, um, inside this the cuttlefish skin. But this is very specific to, to this. Uh, Texa, we actually have a, a, a whole diversity of um, chromatophore structure and tissue organization regarding color change. Um, so here on the on the right side, you have a picture taken by by Alex. A very nice picture of um, of chromatophores in a, in a shrimp. So you see the the morphology is not not it's completely different. You have like uh, neuron like. Uh, um, chromatophore in, in shape and um, it's not um, the cell that will change its morphology but the, the pigments will migrate inside the cell so invading the, the, um, the velocities or, or not. And what's, what's interesting in, uh, in all this is that uh, both these systems are under control of um, of either uh, um, neural or hormonal pathways um, that we know with uh, some some detail depending on the species, and these um, control systems can potentially interact with uh, neuroendocrine disruptors. That's why we are interested in um, developing. Uh, color change as a potential proxy of uh, of such a disruption. So, uh, in the in the literature, we, we already have uh, examples, uh, illustrations of uh, of such uh, interactions uh, with methadomidine, for example, which is one of the compounds to be to be assessed uh, in the Redpole project. Um, a paleness have been observed in uh, in trouts um, exposed to to this product uh, tested. Tests have been conducted also with uh, um, with antidepressants on on several species of uh, crustaceans, um, showing slight effect, but more more difficult to 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 put um, to, to to evidence because of uh, um, um, a high uh, interindividual uh, viability in the in the results, but. That is showing you, but there is there is much to do left for 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 developing these uh, color change elements as a proxy, but um, still it's 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 promising direction to take. So um, in at the University of Hong we are focusing on on cephalopods and uh, or cuttlefish model in in, in specific. Um, so these these cuttlefish they they are really resourceful in terms of. Uh, Camouflage, as you see, even in we if we put them on uh, quite a non-natural and un unexpected background, they they are able to to display an interesting and, and very typical um, camouflage. This is what we call um, a disruptive camouflage. It works a bit like uh, like zebras. Um, it's uh, the the purpose is to to disrupt the edge of the animal, so we don't distinguish it on the background. But it can also uh, camouflage on um, uniform backgrounds, so it will th the body will become completely uniform. So that's basically what we we've been trying to explore, to test, to to put into a to a bioassay. Um, so using uh, hatchlings, 
specifically um, on uh, uniform or uh, checkerboard uh, type of backgrounds. So what we could expect for healthy animals, uh, control animals, uh, is this kind of uh, camouflage. So you don't see them, you don't distinguish them, them that much because they're actually quite good camouflage, especially this one. But with methadomidin, um, well, basically after three days exposure, all the animals remained it like uh, completely dark. So they were basically unable to to adapt uh, to 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 alter the camouflage um, to uh, to 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 escape predators basically. So that's the ultimate uh, um, consequence for for the animals. So this is a more detailed um, appreciation of of these results. Um, see that um, this effect, this darkening, this is the background lumi luminance matching, so the, the difference between uh, the background and the color of the animal. So this is decreasing um, in, a, in a monotonous uh, dose-dependent way in that case. Sorry. Um, we've we are developing um, a second approach, an ex vivo approach of um, color change as a proxy, um, using uh, not whole animals uh, and uh, uh, exposition exposures uh, to the pollutants, but using uh, skin samples. So we basically isolate uh, skin samples from cuttlefish, uh, put them. Uh, on a, on a stereo microscope, and we follow um, the, the the activity of chromatophores. So, looking if there is a potential uh, topical action of of the pollutants. And um, the ultimate aim of such um, approach is to well to reduce the number of animals to be used to to assess um, the potential risk. risk. Um, in this context, we have been developing um, a software to, to analyze such images, because as you, as you imagine, we end up with a lot of images and a lot of chromatophores on, on each image. So this is how our, uh, our software are currently perform. So you see that each chromatophore is delineated. So um, it's a software based on uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning. So we basically had to, to, to train the software to be able to uh, recognize the, the, um, the chromatophores, to distinguish uh, colors, different colors of chromatophores, and to discriminate when they are overlapping also. Um, so now it performs quite good, and we currently have a, a quite, quite good uh, tool to use to test with different compounds. So so far, um, we have been able to to redemonstrate that it was effective using a couple of neurotransmitters that we know they are involved in uh, in the chromatophore activity control, and um, we can show that also with um, the same antidepressants that have been used on crustaceans. Um, and as expected, we see a, um, a decrease in, in the degree of expansion of these chromatophores. Uh, so that was significant. Regarding um, endocrine disruptors, we are still trying to um, refine the biotest to, to be able to be sensitive enough, but we, we observe the same tendency to, to reduction of the chromatophores. Thanks a lot. Um, Cecilia and myself will be happy to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Anaid. Thank you. Cuttlefish are really cool.
Our next speaker is um, Dr. Uh, Corinna Chokan from the University of Brighton. Corinna is a principal lecturer in marine biology and her expertise is in functional ecotoxicology, focusing on biological responses of marine organisms to environmental stressors. Um, I'm just going to give her a second to get set up. I hope you're remembering any questions. It'll be very detailed. Thank you, thank you Lucy, and um, thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, as you can see, we've got those short presentations from each of the, well, some of the partners from Red Bull. Um, we just want to show you what we've been up to, what are the results, and what are we actually trying to prove, you know, um, within this big, big program. Um, at the University of Brighton, we are using molecular methods to develop specific biomarkers. Now, molecular methods, because of COVID, we all had a crash course on, on molecular biology. We all know PCR and what it does, and you know it becomes one of our, uh, a part of our vocabulary to talk about PCR. That's exactly what we do at, at the University of Brighton. So we're trying to develop specific biomarkers. Well, biomarkers are like, quick tests or quick indicators that will tell you that something is wrong. When we go to the doctor and they assess our cholesterol or our heart rate or you know, blood levels, or um, those are biomarkers. That particular information is going to tell you if you're feeling good or not feeling good or there's something going on in your body. And that's exactly what, what we're trying to do here. Good. Um, so we've heard um, from Alex um, a lot about the impact of endocrine disruptions in uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in um, in humans and we know that there are reproductive um, consequences there are fertility problems um, there are um, there is an impact on um, cancer uh, um, prognosis and cancer development. There are neurological um, impairments as well, including autism and um, IQ loss as well. And obviously there are a lot of metabolic changes like um, um, obesity and diabetes. We also heard that um, there are some people are more sensitive to those endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and we also heard that there are special windows of sensitivity in the life of, of humans um, during uh, early childhood mm -hmm. or even, sorry, even um, during um, fetal development, that's when the humans are most sensitive. Well, at the University of Brighton, we work with some very um, small and, um, you know, maybe not that um, um, flagship organism. Um, we work with mussels, we work with oysters, we work with bivalves. And it is very surprising, probably, to say that they kind of behave in the very same way as we do when it comes to their response to the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, in those um, aquatic animals, they would have an impact on metabolism, they would have an impact on um, growth, they would have even uh, an impact on cancer development as well. They will also have a special window of exposure um, when the bivalves are in early stages of development. So they when they're young, let's say, or when they just start their sexual cycle, that's when they are the most sensitive to the endocrine disruption, disrupting chemicals. So that's the comparison that um, we are trying to assess at the University of Brighton. And for doing so, if I can get her out. Um, we are trying, as I said, we are trying to develop those tests because until today, until now, all we know about mollusk in general is 
what we know from this TBT example. We banned, as Alex said, we banned TBT about 20 years ago, apparently it's making a, a, comeba a comeback now. But the most robust test in terms of endocrine disruption in invertebrates is that InfoSex that has been developed for, um, for dog bikes. What about all the other animals that are impacted every single day at very low doses, as, as Christophe was saying? Where are the tests? How can we prove that those particular animals are imp impacted? Um, we're looking at reproduction mainly at Brighton University. Um, as I said, we're looking at bee valves, we're looking at mussels and oysters, and we're looking at the molecular level. So we want to capture that very first si signal that something is going uh, wrong in the organism. And that signal is gene expression. Um, again, a quick uh, crushed uh, lecture in gene expression. We all have the genes present in, in our DNA. It's the problem is, is the trick between being expressed or not being expressed that makes the difference. Let's say that at some particular time in the day we need insulin, then there are special um, um, sequences that will be activated in our DNA to produce the RNA for the insulin. At other particular times in the day we don't need insulin, then the gene is suppr suppressed, the gene is silent. And so there's only very light transcription or none at all. And so the, the product, the final product, is not present or is in there in very, very low levels. So that's what we're trying to see if those signals are actually activated in muscles by the endocrine disruptors. And for doing this, we are exposing the organism to various contaminants um, and we are measuring the levels of those gene variations. And we discovered, uh, this one doesn't want. Are there any signals to tell us that the mussels or the oysters or the clams are actually um, responding to those endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals in the environment? Are those early PCR based signal. Are they there for mussels or for oysters? Well, we discovered that there are a lot of them there. Um, those are some data from field, so from scrobicularia, from peppery furrow clam, it's called, I think. And we observed that there are plenty of genes that are very different in male scrobicularia compared to intersex scrobicularia. So there's something going on at the gene level that will make all the intersex, sorry, all the intersex animals, so the ones that are part female, part male, having a very different expression in, in, um, their, gen um, in their genome. And that is part of the, the search that we do. We want to find that signal. So it's, it's a little bit like if we take this muscle to the doctor and we measure one of this, the doctor will be able to say, yes, that's been under the influence of an endocrine disruptor or something like that. So we've put a lot of candidates in the environment. And as you can see, some of them are really you know, self-explanatory. We have a, a testicular haploid express gene, so something that is really involved in, in, in uh, reproduction that might be a very, very good marker, a very good indicator for, uh, for the problem. We also exposed some of our muscles when they were young and then when they were old to various endocrine um, disrupting chemicals, and those are exposed to um, ethanyl estradiol um, and 17-beta estradiol, I think, on the other side. So compounds that are present in birth control pill, for example, and that are also very, very present in the environment. And as you can see, and that's to confirm the story that there are windows of opportunities when the mussels or the oysters are most sensitive to, to the contaminants, pretty much like with humans. In the mature mussels, the effect is not that drastic. 
when it comes to the immature ones, to the early stages, to the ones that are just starting to develop sexual development, especially the, the impact is absolutely massive. And again, you can see that we had to break the scale here because actually those, um, those bars were much, much higher. So a, a very interesting behavior and unfortunately a very worrying behavior, obviously, um, when it comes to, um, where are my guys going? to um, different um, uh, stages in, in the development. Um, we use paracetamol, the you know, very common, boring um, uh, pharmaceutical that we all use maybe you know, a, a couple of times a week sometimes. Um, and we looked at the impact of paracetamol in muscles and what exactly environmentally relevant concentration of paracetamol will do. Well, this is, those are females, and this is the Musashi family. So this is a, a, an obscure, if you want, gene family uh, that is involved in the development of uh, the testes. So the reproductive um, uh, structure, the reproductive organ in, in muscle. As you can see, there is nothing going on in females. As I said, we all have the genes. The trick is if they are expressed or not, pretty much like the beta logenin in, in uh, fish, you know, in the talk earlier. So nothing happens in, in female. When it comes to male, obviously in the control, we would have a high express gene. The testis is uh, stimulated, let's say, the development is going well as we apply the environmentally relevant paracetamol, just paracetamol, the gene is completely shut down. And that's it. Another, oops, another example would be the um, GTPase, the road GTPase, um, and that in humans has been um, um, suggested that it will upregulate the transcription in breast cancer cells. And again here, you can see that normal express in control completely shut down in, um, in exposed animals. This is sperm motility. A lot of those genes are coming up. So apparently one of the uh, quickest or the most common effect of endocrine disruptors would be to attack the, the motility or the genes the structures that are included in the motility of the sperm. And here you can see, again, that in the control we have some high, fun high uh, activity, high expression of uh, those genes involved in motility. Suddenly they are completely shut down in the exposed animals. Um, egg envelope, it's again another one of the very nice example of how the endocrine disruptors will, will um, impact the reproduction. And here is again a story of, uh, you know, the um, actual uh, story of um, what exactly Christophe was saying a little bit earlier, that we don't have a monotone response. We don't increase the dose and expect to see a yet more catastrophic uh, uh, response from the animal. We have res uh, responses at very low concentrations, and then things are getting a little bit messier. But that doesn't mean that we should chuck more of the chemicals in the water, because that will solve the problem. It means th it means that it's really, really upsetting to see that you know two grains of sugar in a swimming pool can change you know the reproduction of an entire species, or can mean even you know, the extinction of the entire population on that particular spot. And that's exactly wi wi what we see here with the TCC, trichlocarbon, which is an antibacterian. You know, it's in the same category, if you say, with um, triclosan. Whenever you get a shampoo or a, um, um, a soap, a hand soap, and you look on, on the um, components, you will see antibacterian. Very rarely you'll see cyclocarbon or triclosan, but that's exactly what it is. And unfortunately, it does exactly what it says on the tin. You wash and everything is going down the drain and it's going out there. So it's a huge concentration of those antibacterian in the water. And that's what they do. VIRL expression. VIRL is, is a gene that is coding for a protein that is on top of the egg. And that protein is going to recognize the sperm, is going to catch the sperm, and is going to facilitate the entire fertilization. 
VCL is another gene. Th this time is on top of the sperm, and that gene is going to recognize the egg, and so they're going to um, uh, facilitate the fertilization. So if we mass, as you can see, you have the control. We expressed everything compared to control. We have the control. Look how increased this gene is, how high this gene is, just at a very, very low concentration of, of TCC. On the other side, this gene is completely suppressed at, again, very, very low concentration of, of uh, TCC, triclocarbon, this antibacterium that I was talking about. So small concentrations can make a huge difference. You know probably, or you don't know very well, that uh, the actual fertilization in most of the invertebrates in, in the um, aquatic inver um, environment happens outside. You have a muscle, a male muscle, you have a female muscle, they spit the, the gametes outside in, in the water, and that's where everything is happening. If they don't find each other, or if this protein doesn't match with this protein, then the egg and the sperm are never going to come together and they're no, never going to fertilize. And so you're not going to have a new muscle, you know, for the new generation. But the effects are not necessarily only in the re reproduction. Here we're talking about proto-oncogenes. So genes that are implicated in the growth, in the development of, of um, the muscle. And as you can see again, you, you have a very nice and active gene expression in the control and then everything is suppressed in the um, uh, exposed muscles. And we also have implications for apoptosis or cell death markers, which are kind of nasty, sort of nasty genes because they can action in both ways. Um, the program cell death is a very important process that happens in the organism. Whenever there is something wrong with a cell, this apoptosis is happening, it, it just kills the cell, let's say, and gets rid of the problem. So we want to have an active gene expression, an active um, um, function of the apoptosis in, in the um, organism. If that is not happening, if that gene is suppressed, means that we have malfunctioning cells that are going to divide and transmit that mal malfunction to the, s to the uh, other cells. So we have a cancer, basically. So a suppression of the apoptosis gene results in cancer. And that's exactly what is happening here. And those are actually cancer, lymphatic um, is lymphoma in a muscle. So, it, and it's very similar to non-Hodgkin lymphoma in, um, in humans. If we have a highly expressed apoptosis um, gene, like is happening in here with CASP, then this auto destruction of, of the cell is exacerbated. And that, that's exactly what is happening here in the gonad of a muscle where big, functional, normal eggs actually go through this stage of apoptosis and cell death and the reproduction is not going to happen because something is telling to that particular muscle that she's in danger, just abort all the reproduction and concentrate on survival. So this cell death is generalized and um, the reproduction is not going to happen for that particular individual. So again, exactly like Christopher was saying, it's a very fine balance. Too much and you get on this stage, too little you get on this other stage. And that's what's very, very tricky and very sometimes hard to, to identify in endocrine disruption, this very slip of, of, of the ba balance one way or another. Um, and other considerations you probably heard, again, from my colleagues, um, sometimes males are more sensitive than females to endocrine disruption. We heard a lot about 
you know, non, uh, sperm count and uh, the um, development of prostate or, you know, the, the uh, size of testicles or undeveloped testicles and so on. So um, there is a lot to, to um, uh, research and to study in this area. Why and how? Shall we use only males when we uh, talk about environmental considerations? Shall we use only males as, as uh, organism uh, um, of for experimentation? Um, and then we don't know much about chronic exposures. Unfortunately, it's quite easy sometimes, you know, to, to do experimental um, laboratory experiments only for three days, five days, seven days. Uh, we have to remember that out there. Some organisms are exposed for a long, long time and what exactly that chronic exposure is doing, we don't know yet. Um, but we are trying to find out and hopefully we'll come with some responses soon. Thank you. Thank you, Corinna, thank you. Um, I actually